right. Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde and welcome to Concordia University's Fourth Space. Thank you so much for joining us for creating content for video games. I'll be passing it over to our panel for introductions in just a minute. But first, whether you're joining us in person or online, welcome. We wanted to let you know that we're streaming to YouTube live from Fourth Space, which is located on unceded indigenous lands here in Jagay, Montreal. As caretakers for the lands and waters we are meeting on today, we'd like to extend our gratitude to, to the Kanyankahaga Nation for their teachings about the earth and our relations. If you're new to Force Space, uh, what do we do here? Well, we work with our university community to mobilize and exchange knowledge by co-creating daily activities such as this one. You're in for a treat today. It's a great pleasure to have collaborated with Writers Read for this panel on designing, writing for, and producing video games. Hi, Kate. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, to those of you here and those of you out in cyberspace, I hope not in a little white balloon, uh, you are very, very welcome. My name is Kay Stearns and I teach on the Faculty of Creative Writing. Uh, we're delighted uh, to present the last in our series of the Writing Life um, for Writers Read, in which we introduce students and of course all other interested parties to jobs in the creative industries. Um, some they might not have considered, others I think like today that they have very much considered but with like to know a lot more about. Now, before I introduce our wonderful panel, please allow me to offer some thanks uh, to those who helped make this event happen. First and foremost, Dean Seacott and the Faculty of Arts and Science, who so generously fund Writers Read. My invaluable friend and partner in crime, Stephanie Bolster. Uh, together, we've had to fill the very formidable shoes of uh, Sina Karas, who was on leave this past year, but I'm delighted to say that uh, Sina will be back and in the saddle next year and is already planning um, a year of wonderful events. Certainly neither Stephanie nor I could have managed this year without the stellar contributions of our Writers Read assistants, Fab Pilon, who is over there, and Paz O'Farrell, who in fact is doing double duty today as moderator and as birthday girl. So perhaps we could just say happy birthday, Paz. Thank you very much. Thanks also to our fearless and unflappable administrator, Olivia Ward, her assistant, Julia Clark Combote, and last but very far from least, a huge thank you to Jacqueline, Anna, and everyone here at Force Space. What a joy to collaborate with you all again. Now, before turning to the main event, I want to just briefly mention that the last event of Writers Read will be taking place tonight in fact, we have two exceptional poets, Liz Howard, who will, I'm very happy to say, be joining our creative writing faculty next year, and Julianne Otak bitek who teaches at Queen's, and they will be reading tonight at 6 o'clock in the EV building next door to us, EV 1.615. So if you are uh, available, I know that will be a wonderful event as well. But I would like to now, of course, turn to today's event and very briefly introduce our four panelists. Mays Longboat uh, is a senior partner relations manager with Unity Technologies and served as Skins Workshop Associate Director with Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace and the Initiative for Indigenous Futures from 2019 to 21. He holds an MA in Media Studies from studies, 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 studies from Concordia University, uh, where we are, of course, now. His master's research examined indigenous video game development through the production of his own game, Terra Nova, an award-winning cooperative platformer with an interactive narrative. And I do look forward to understanding what I just said by the end of today. <laughs> that would be wonderful. I will also add that his enthusiastic response to participating in this panel was instrumental in making it happened. So thank you very much. Uh, and indeed, he brought Osama Dorius to us as well, who is a lead content designer at Blizzard Entertainment and when not on sabbatical, teaches game design just down the road from us at Dawson College. Uh, additionally, he co-hosts a lively podcast called The Habibis, in which three game developers drink some good Arab tea and discuss a wide variety of topics, including Nick Cage. Uh, Osama is especially committed to giving a voice to marginalized people and causes, and he was instrumental in co-founding the Montreal Independent Games Award. And we turn to Jill Murray, uh, best known whoops, for her work on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, The Big Con, and a few Assassin's Creeds. In past lives, Jill studied theater production, was a web developer, and published two YA novels about breakdancing teenagers, and really there can never be too many. 
novels about breakdancing teenagers. Her company is Disco Globe Interactive, and I'll also say that I probably first approached Jill about eight years ago uh, trying to get you to, to come, and uh, her very busy schedule has always intervened, so it's a particular pleasure to welcome her here today. You did not. You didn't. You came and talked to me, but we didn't get you. Did you? No. We'll talk about it. I'm getting old. My memory is slipping. But we were going, oh, it was the course that we wanted to do, but we didn't get. That's what I'm remembering. Now, la okay. Last but not least, certainly not least, Ashley Escura is a Canadian-Mexican multidisciplinary poet. She is a co-founder of new media studio Apocobliss, where she works as a narrative sonographer, scriptwriter, and co-conceptualizer of experimental video games and digital environments, one of which, Museum of Symmetry, wonderful name, won multiple awards, including the Canadian Screen Award for Best Virtual Reality Game in 2019 for its excellence in digital storytelling. I'm also very proud to say she's a graduate of our program, and we're delighted to welcome her back. So clearly, there is a wealth of fascinating experience here, most of which I did not even remotely touch on, but which I hope will come out in the conversation. And I can think of no one better to get the conversation started than our wonderful graduate student, Paz O'Farrell. Paz, take it away. Thank you, Kate. Well, thank you, panelists, for being here to discuss writing for video games. I'd like to set the tone with a quote by Professor Oscar Morales, who taught me everything I know about this topic. Video games as media texts that provide experiences of narrative and formal play, and as works that fit into larger cultural contexts that address who gets to play and how and why we play. Thank you also, all of you, for being here today on this beautiful day. And I'm not just saying that because I bought uh, Disco Elysium, the final cut, as a birthday present to myself. So that's kind of great. Well, I thought we could start with the specifics of your jobs, your daily responsibilities, and Jill, I know that you wanted to talk about the title of this panel. Does that sound an amicable start? Sure, but we can talk about our responsibilities. I guess the title of the panel has fluctuated between writing for games and video game content creation. And I just wanted to clear the air that what we do is not really content creation because we're trying to pull together experiences for a player, which is really something completely different, um, which can involve sometimes creating a content, but it also involves pulling together the entire form and meaning and structure of the thing that you're providing for the player. And sometimes it feels like you're doing that through the power of sheer will and your own stomach muscles. Uh, so it's not like there's a bucket in the middle of the room and everyone can put some content into it. Um, so my responsibility is currently I'm a creative director, uh, which means I spend the entire day trying to get out of everybody's way and just making sure that I've cleared enough things off my to-do list that everyone else can get something done. Previously, uh, my background is more in um, writing and narrative design, so that can be anything from um, creating design documents to writing to research. Um, but even in that role, really needing to understand what all of the other people on the team are doing and what their jobs require so that I can plug myself in to their routines and make sure that the player has everything that they need to understand. Not just the story that is being like told through the game, but also the story of how the player experiences the game. Yeah, so I'm uh, the co-founder of Apocalypse Studios with my main collaborator, Paloma Dawkins. And um, seeing as our work isn't specifically like a nine to five, like most of the work I, I work on is project based. Um, but we just so happen to be at the beginning of, of a new game that we're working on. Um, but I'd say like the, the, the work that I do generally um, as a writer of these games is uh, a lot of conversing. We have a lot of conversations in our group about the world we want to build and what we want people to feel. And we flush out a lot. There's a lot of imagina imagination that happens in lots of our meetings. Um, so I talk to all the members of our group and then I try to bring it all down to earth through language and trying to synthesize all of these very abstract concepts into something very s simple. Um, from there, I do 
quite a bit of character development. I spend a lot of time thinking about <laughs> these characters we create and how to animate them and what they're saying. Um, and yeah, we just, my, my main role is trying to synthesize all the things we talk about and, and make uh, really interesting stories from them. Hello, yes, hi, um, I'm Maze. Um, currently, I'm a senior partner relations manager at Unity Technologies, just down the way in, in uh, Point St. Charles. So, I, and I've been at that role for two years now, and then I guess I would consider myself out of the content, quote unquote, we'll, we'll put big scare quotes around content, um, the content creation aspect uh, of game development for, for about that amount of time. But um, right now I consider myself to be creatively helping um, solve <laughs> uh, technical problems with teams um, kind of all over the world that are, that are using that tool. Um, but before I did that, um, I was a graduate student here at Concordia. I was in the media studies program. Um, and for my, my master's thesis, I, I chose to go the route of making a game um, and using my own experience of making a game to kind of lead the research down a road of like, what does it mean to create as an indigenous creator? Um, and I had to write a bunch of content for that game too. So I feel like um, it, it's a viable route if you're looking to get into um, making things to like tie your studies to making things. Um, and I feel like that will be my contribution here today. Um, so yes, hello. Um, I have been a generals game designer for the last 15 years in the industry. I've had many different roles, uh, re-specialized a few times as a uh, UI designer, economy designer, narrative designer, uh, systems designer, name it. Uh, my current role is content designer, which is a term that nobody understands. I still get poked uh, from content creators online asking me how I broke into Blizzard as a content creator. But I'm not a content creator uh, in that sense. So we don't make videos and play games, which there's nothing wrong with. That's just not what I do. Um, I've worked at uh, other studios before, like Warner Brothers and uh, Ubisoft, like bigger studios. And I've also worked at really tiny studios that you've probably never heard of. Uh, making all kinds of different entertainment, uh, such as in-flight entertainment. Uh, you know, when you're in an airplane and you're trying to sleep and someone's poking the back of your seat because they're playing a game. Uh, I'm sorry about that. That was my fault for a couple <laughs> of years. Uh, so yes, uh, big games, small games, and different roles. My current role, really, I think a, a better title would have possibly been lead mission designer because a lot of most of the content that we're creating are like missions, activities for the players to do, uh, quests, if you'd like. Um, and my job involves really being the glue between a lot of different departments. We come up with different activities that the player wants to do, and then we check with the systems team to make sure that these are things that we're going to have support for, and we check with the narrative team to make sure that this is a story that we do want to tell and it fits into their cohesive story, like the, their overarching story. Uh, so there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of working with a lot of teams, and I love people, so that's why I gravitate to this role. Well, Sam, I think you may be well positioned to kick us off with the next question, actually, because you mentioned working for small studios and working for bigger companies. And, you know, before I even moved to Montreal, I knew that it was a video game city. You know, it was a special effects city. This was everything that was happening there. Then I got here and I found out it's the only city I've ever known where people can pay their rent by being poets, too. And there's just a lot of artistry and independent game development happening in as well. And as Kate mentioned, you helped with the Independent Game Awards. So could you tell the people here today a bit more about the difference between those two modes of, you know, working with games? Yeah, well, we can speak for hours about the differences, but uh, I'll try to sum it up a little bit. Uh, you really, when you're working on small companies, you usually have to wear more hats. You do more things. Uh, and I love wearing hats, both literally and figuratively. <laughs> Uh, and part of that is you're not going to have just one role. Like generally when you're working at a big company, you, depending on where you are uh, in the organization, you tend to have to specialize in a thing. Like I know uh, one of my friends worked on the Far Cry brand at Ubisoft for a decade working on Barks. Uh, 
Do you know what barks are? Or maybe I'll explain. It's like when uh, one form of bark is when you approach an NPC and they say something because you know you trigger uh, the, there's a trigger volume around them. They detect your you know game state and then they say something. Those barks, that system looks like rain one, today. Sorry, say again. I'll say looks like rain today. Yes, yes. Or welcome to our village. Or I really need to go to the bathroom. Or whatever other barks you could have. Uh, that. I know a person who did only that for 10 years on only one brand. Uh, on a small indie studio, that would be impossible. That would be one person's job on a Tuesday and for the entire game, like depending on the size for of the project. For 30 minutes on a Tuesday. <laughs> for honest. 30 minutes on a Tuesday is more accurate. Absolutely. So it's really that. Like when you're working for a smaller studio, you're going to have a long list of responsibilities. And because of the nature of the job, you're not going to be able to deep dive on a lot of them. Uh, and a lot of the prototype type things that we do at the bigger studios are shippable at smaller studios. And that's not a knock on smaller studios at all. That's why so much of the innovation comes from these smaller studios because they have the ability to be able to innovate. Their, their cycles are, are uh, much smaller. And as a result, they could iterate faster and try things uh, with, with less risk. Um, so the, the nature of the beast is very different. Both are capable of creating incredible experiences, but their experiences are going to be very different as a result. Does that make sense? So thinking about it from a grad student perspective who have, has never created a game before, um, I had to wear nearly every hat um, imaginable when creating a game. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, doing this as like a first timer, it was incredibly hard. I leaned on a lot of different people and mentors to, to get through it. Um, that being said, I, I also had the privilege of hiring a very small team of three other people plus myself. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a visual artist. I am not a programmer. I am not a sound designer. So I would, th these are the folks that I brought in to create my game, Terra Nova. Um, you know, super small scoped game, 2D, like, you know, like a 20 minute experience front to back. Um, but I could, but I knew I could write dialogue and I could kind of envision a story and direct a project, um, essentially like taking over the, the producer type type role. Um, and I got through it. So I don't, I don't have the experience of doing things on a triple A big budget level, but uh, when you're thinking about just like doing it, picking up and doing it yourself uh, as a solo developer or developer who has uh, a small team around you, um, yes, indeed, you need to be able to be adaptive and, and have a lot of skills to bring to the table. Um, it's also like a, a great proving ground to really get to know yourself as a creative too. Like um, through that creative, creative process of making a game, I, I realized that hmm, maybe I'm not actually a creative in a traditional sense. Maybe I am much more passionate and talented at uh, identifying and solving problems. Um, uh, from a, a strategic minded perspective and not necessarily like doing the actual uh, editing of lines of code to, to solve, you know, a t like a problem directly, but to support the people who would be able to actually do that. Um, that's where I felt like my skills really grew during that process. So um, yeah, I guess just as a, as a word of advice, like keep exploring the different uh, multidisciplinary aspects of, of, making, of making games, because it truly is almost every medium you can kind of think of in one, <laughs> depending on the game. Totally, and, and riffing on that, I think it's important for creators of games to be having fun, <laughs> if you know what I mean. I feel like sometimes, I mean, my experience is working with, with indie, indie games, so I've never had the experience of working with like a huge team or um, having like a ton of, of uh, deadlines and stuff. So I feel like we have a lot of fun with the work that we do at Apocalypse and we do a lot of experimentation. And I think the benefit of working with a smaller studio is, is just being able to experiment, um, being able to allow yourself to make mistakes, to learn, um, the stakes are, you know, I mean, their stakes are always important, but the stakes seem to be a bit lower. And I feel like for Paloma and I, that's such an important part um, of who we are as, as artists and as creators. Um, and so we, I feel, feel very comfortable in this sort of um, 
playful world that we we like to tap into when we create. Um, but I'd love to hear what you have to say. I have noticed something changing in the last few years, which is really large publishers either acquiring or hiring a whole smaller studios to um, build more games for their existing IPs and then, but demanding they be of a higher quality than they would normally ship for an indie product, um, which is attractive to a lot of senior devs who have burned out on AAA. But what you end up doing when you're in that situation is now you have to both deep dive and wear five hats. Um, so that's special. <laughs> the, worst, the worst of both worlds. What works in every situation, like what the way we were describing our jobs before is at least three of us described just being glue to help out other departments. And we described that in the context of doing our own job. What works best is on whatever project you're on, if at least three or four of your key people in different departments identify themselves as glue. Because you're always going to have people who won't or can't be glue and are just going to be off in their own corner doing the one thing they can do or getting distracted and doing the wrong thing or like just doing something that's not quite beneficial. But if you have like four glue people being glue, it's going to work out. So if you can focus on, on two things, it's like just being good at learning and adapting and being glue. Yeah. And if we ever have a chance to talk about downscoping, yeah. that. What you just said, Jill, reminds me of something you've said to me before, Ashley, uh, about the rights, actually. And not to get into like, legal writing, I know we're all interested in more creative video game stuff, but this is uh, an important issue for you know, people to know that they might have to face if you're interested in Yeah. That. So the first game I worked on was called Museum of Symmetry, and it was produced by the National Film Board. Um, and I was fresh out of university at that time, and Paloma, I know, was also, I think, in her 20s. And we signed some contracts with them um, that we didn't... We weren't really thinking, like, super long-term, you know? We were just stoked to have the opportunity. We took it. Um, what ended up happening actually though is Paloma and I really fell in love with the characters that we developed in Museum of Symmetry and we really wanted to bring them back and flesh out their stories more. Um, but what happened is in the contracts we had signed, we'd actually signed away the rights to use those characters. Um, which was really devastating for us, honestly, just because they were truly ours, you know, like we had made them, we imagined them. And the game has since been sent, uh, sold to Astria Media, so it's further away from us now. Um, so it's, it's a frustrating situation, but it's actually what encouraged Paloma and I to start Apocalypse, which is still a very young company. Um, we really just want to own the rights to, to our characters and our creations, so, but we had to learn that the hard way. That's often the case. Osama, I know you have a lot of thoughts on downscoping. <laughs> Always down scope. You, every project, okay, so teaching uh, at Dawson College, every single student thinks that they understand down scoping when you explain it to them and then over scope. And that's not just a student thing, that's definitely a dev thing. The, like on the topic of down scoping is you can never scope too low. You're always, go, there's always going to be bloat. Things are always going to become a lot more complex before. Uh, so I don't know the audience and if you are, have people here who haven't worked on games before, but if you want to start working on your own little pet project, think of the tiniest thing that you could possibly make and make half of that and plan to make it in four times more the time than you think it'll take. And you'll probably be a little bit late. That's just how it works with games. And I'm sure you have a lot to say about that too. When I was in theater production school, our lighting teacher in first year, Shalom Dolgoy, shared something that I've never forgotten. And he said, like, when you're planning a project in theater, but I think this works for 
just literally everything. He's like, think about how long each individual component will take. Add it all together. Add 40% and then double it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that math. That will keep you safe, I think, a lot of the time. Um, no one wants to do it. Everyone will look at that and go, no, and just forge ahead. But then at some point when, you, when it comes down to cutting at the, at the least comfortable moment of production, uh, you can think back to that and be like, no, wait, I am justified. That's fair. Yeah, and I just like to add, I think as writers, um, creative, writing, creative writing students, um, there's this expression like kill your darlings, like you, always, you know, like not getting too precious about, about the lines and losing parts of the, of the story you're trying to tell or the poem. Um, that was like one of my biggest shocks, I think, about working in games, specifically VR, is that we had, we had scoped out like a ton, like way more than we had needed. Um, and we ended up having to cut like, I think honestly, like 70%, um, which is something, you know, as a newcomer into the, into the industry, I really didn't understand, but I actually like really loved it. I f found I learned a lot about being a writer through working in games and, um, yeah, as a simple, like so much goes into like the creation of, of the world, but you don't get to really see it in the end result. Um, it's all like sort of embedded into the game itself. Well, let's dive a bit deeper into like this specific building blocks that we're talking about for the production. Um, dialogue was brought up before, so maybe we can start there. It, it gets a bad reputation, you know? Like I, I've left movies before and people are like, oh, that was a horrible script. It was like video game dialogue. And it's like, ah, well, some of the most beautiful lines that I have seen in my life have come out of the mouth of characters before, or maybe just not even beautiful writing, but just so in character. And uh, so I'm wondering how, as a personal approach, you tackle and build dialogue. I know we have a variety of works for this. I'll just start by saying I'm not a writer. I have had lines that I wrote that shipped uh, but, but that's not the same thing. They were intended to be placeholder lines. So I set up uh, missions and I've written barks before and I've done things, I've written descriptions of items and things like that, but I'll never refer to myself as a writer. So I'll defer okay, to the wait, experts. Did they work? They worked. They so worked. So are you able to describe why? Why? Yes, actually. Okay. So there's one thing I could say is that I'm pretty happy with my Barks writing. And generally, uh, spe specifically if it's about uh, NPCs that have like a personality or background or something like that. And the, the, the way that I usually approach this is I write way more lines than I need. And then I try to figure which line can only this character say. And if I find one of those, then I stick with that but I don't throw away the other lines. I put them in a giant Excel sheet so that I could refer to them later because sometimes the creativity doesn't come and you're like, oh, okay, I got this big repository of other things I've written before. And I try to do the same thing later when I have to write a bark for another character and say, from these, which one would only this character say? Um, and I find that's all, because I'm not a good writer, I just do the brute well, force approach. That. He says he's not a writer. <laughs> you just described the a good process. Yeah, it's it's a process that you do when you can't come up with anything oh, good at the beginning. That's a good so process. Just, a writer needs a process. Yes. You just described a really good process for writing barks. The well, only thing I would add to that is when I'm writing barks, like let's say you have to write 500 lines and they're split up across 13 events and it's like for six different random goons that will speak at any time. I will just like, in my head, I will give each generic person a personality so then I'm not thinking up six variations each time I just have to write the overly optimistic guy the pessimistic guy the guy whose feet hurt you know <laughs> I have my six and then it's really easy to go through the iterations yeah. otherwise no notes that's very validating coming from you Jill thank you so maybe I'm a mediocre writer <laughs> I'll get to you in a second about that <laughs> Yeah, what do I want to say about this? Um, I mean, maybe I'll just explain a little bit about what it was like to write for Terra Nova, which was the game I, I mentioned I made for my master's. Um, and, I, and, and writing was the thing that I really like took upon myself because um, I felt like the type of story I wanted to tell, which was like this 
expansive exploration of first contact between like indigenous people and colonizers in the future. Um, but from a perspective of like, but from like from an indigenous perspective, because, well, an indigenous perspective yet balanced perspective. I, I really felt like this was a game that was like trying to represent me as a person. My dad is Mohawk from Six Nations. My mom is, you know, French Canadian from here. And it just felt like I needed to make something that I knew about. And it was just like this experience of being mixed. Um, but getting down to the nuts and bolts, I, I just had to basically think about, um, well, actually I'll, I'll frame I'll back up and frame it. So in the game, it's a two player cooperative game, um, kind of like a side scroller platform. You just kind of jump around and, and talk to people. Um, but there's two playable characters. There's Tara, who's this indigenous character I wrote um, who lives far in the future. And Nova, this uh, young plucky spaceman, um, who uh, you know, they're kind of formed in this like dual identity within the game itself. Um, and so, you know, these characters are very different. Um, they both carry their own like unique pr unique perspectives. And when framed in the the overarching narrative of like first contact, I really needed to like play that out within my own like psyche as I was writing these characters too. So. Um, what ended up happening was Merdad, the technical director, basically wrote this tool within Unity to read a Twine file, which is basically like an HTML. And so I like I was familiar with Twine, so I just like jumped in in there and basically created like this this hyperlinked branching narrative within that platform, and then imported the exported file into Unity, and Unity was able to read it and create this like multi-option dialogue between the two characters. So um, that was really cool. It was very accommodating um, as a writer in that moment, as someone who wouldn't know how to create a tool like that. Um, but I felt like it was a really like natural way for me to work and like get those two dualist, but also overlapping perspectives into into that experience. Yeah, and for me, for character development, um, I create a lot at the beginning. Like usually, how it works is Paloma will send me like an animation of a character that she's thinking about. So what do you think of this? Um, I spend time looking at the character, thinking about it. I do a lot of um, like character sketching, um, like trying to understand. I create stories for them. Kind of what we do in creative writing, you really try to flush out this character as much as possible. Even if they're only going to say like two lines in the game, I think that this is something that I really care about um, is, yeah, just really getting in there and trying to understand them. Um, but one technique that I started using um, the first time uh, with Museum of Symmetry, and I've continued to do that, is um, I remember I sent a draft to, to Paloma, and she, she had commented that all the characters counted, kind of sounded the same. And that was actually something that I felt a little um, like insecure about. Um, this was like my first time writing for games. And what we ended up doing um, to help, at least in my mind, differentiate between the characters is assigned different zodiac signs to um, each character, which like immediately kind of created this like whole world and identity around them. And it's something that I continue to do to this day. And I, I think it's like, Paz, I know that you also said that you do this in your writing. So it's a really cool trick. I don't know, it, helped, it helps me kind of differentiate between the different characters. Um, I feel like maybe one thing I can add to what's already been said is just, um, for things that are not systemic dialogue, which is what we've been mostly talking about, but we do also have more traditional scenes sometimes in games. Oftentimes when um, people bump on a line of dialogue, it's actually because the, the scene is poorly constructed. There isn't uh, actual drama happening in the scene. For example, you have a scene that's just made of two characters talking about another character and there's not actually any tension or there's no dramatic event happening between them. So there's nothing substantial for them to be talking about. And so the lines they're saying come across as kind of goofy. And there's not really much you can do to write your way out of that other than by cutting the scene uh, and having an actual dramatic event happen there. Or the scene is just running too long. You, you entered it too uh, early, you let it, run past the time when the characters should have left. Um, so 
if you're having trouble with dialogue, you can always stop and just concentrate on something else. Look at how your scenes are built. Um, focus on your strengths and other things that you can control. Take a walk, make somebody a Gemini, and then come back <laughs> and attack it again later. Yeah. That's very true. That's very, I mean, it's just easy to focus from an outside perspective on the dialogue as a, you know, like, oh, that's what writing for video games means. But as you were saying, like, so much of it is like building a plot. And so much of it is that environmental storytelling, too. We were just talking about this before the panel started uh, with The Last of Us, for example. And, you know, I'm interested to hear more about all of these as we go along. But there's also, I think, an interesting tension that's kind of unique to video games as a medium, which is the amount of player agency that you afford them in these narratives in those three different ways, you know, like, do they have different dialogue options that will change the outcome of the story? Is it, again, environmental storytelling where they just have to look to find the little details? Is it et cetera, et cetera? How much budget do you have? <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> That's where it starts. Say more. Yeah. Well, do anyway, So environmental storytelling, do you have environment artists? Do you have level designers who can make the environment? Or is your budget more like we're making a visual novel because we have the budget to have a few flat screens with 2D characters who can talk to each other, in which case maybe I'm going to go with branching dialogue because that's where I'm going to be able to make variety for the player. On the other hand, like who is on your team? Did you just make a team with your two best friends and neither of your two best friends are writers, in which case now it's super expensive to have branching dialogue. So a lot of the time, the choices we give the players have a lot to do with the DNA of our team and our funding and all of these other factors. Um, and there's not, and it's also who is your player? What do they want? Um, and player agency doesn't only come from the dialogue. I think one of the most interesting narrative games I'm playing right now is Marvel Snap. Yep. No dialogue, just yep. cards. Mm -hmm. So it's a more complicated question than uh, just looking at like, do I give them branching or no? It's like, well, let's start with how much money you have. Yeah. <laughs> Comes down to that. Uh, like to add, that was a wonderful answer. I was going to touch on some of those points to add to that. Uh, how much story does your game need? Uh, like a good example of this, if you go back, to, uh, I'm going to date myself now, but uh, an old Tetris game that came out on the GameCube, I think it was called Tetris World, uh, gave character and personality to the blocks and made them come from different planets and gave you this whole background story about them. And uh, I remember like I played it and I'm like, this is awful. I don't want any of this. I just want to get to the action. I don't need but this. But then also Thomas was alone. Yes, but Thomas was alone was needed that story and created characters out of those blocks. Tetris World did not. It wasn't telling any kind of story other than it was tacked on. It didn't need it. So a good part of it is what are you trying to make? Who's the team that you have? And what is the level of story that you need that serves the, the, the purpose of this? Another example, I forget the name of the game, but it was made by a local studio, uh, Tales of Mistral or something like that. Is that what it was? So they hired uh, Ed Greenwood, who was a legendary Dun Dungeon and Dragons, uh, like Forgotten Realms writer, to write the back the, the background story of their game. Uh, and this was made in the form of a whole bunch of like exposition and dialogue form at the beginning of the game that lasted a really long time. And what they found through their metrics is that players were skipping that completely. And then if you look at the other approach where uh, Elden Ring hired George R. R. Martin to write the lore, and their approach was like, we want you to embed everything that we create with this rich narrative, but we don't want that level of exposition. Which one was a better approach? Both of them did the same thing. They hired a legendary writer, legendary, depending on, you know, I don't know when, when someone becomes legendary, but <laughs> by their own admission, a legendary writer. Uh, and they had them write back, background story, but the exposition was completely different. The, the, the process that they went through was completely different. And one, in my opinion, served the game much better than, than the other. So really, how much story do you need? How, how much story does your game need is a very important question. I'm going to relate this back to, to Terra Nova because as a student, again, a first timer, I failed miserably at this. 
Absolutely miserably. Um, I really wanted the game to have branching dialogue that would actually like impact the final outcome of the narrative. Like would the colonizers that came back to earth, even though they had left thousands of years before, um, would they, would they settle or would they, you know, wage war or would they just pick up and leave? Like these are the, the kind of the main three, like, I guess, story endings I wanted to write. Um, but because of budget and resourcing concerns, constraints, limitations, I needed to scope down. And basically what hap ended up happening was I created fake, faked uh, <laughs> interactive narrative where to progress the dialogue, you would choose an option, but it wouldn't do anything. It would just play the next thing. So I had to write it in a way that was really awkward and you know, gave the illusion of choice, but there was actually no choice. It was very sad. I was very disappointed, but I wasn't disappointed because I graduated. <laughs> uh, I was able to show something and be be proud that that something had been done, uh, even though you know behind the scenes I was just I, I couldn't shake remembering um, all of the things I wanted to add. So going back to that that descoping um, conversation we were having, and going back to resourcing, and then actually like execution and what what ended up happening. Uh, you shouldn't feel bad about this, like. <laughs> This is done on every project that has any kind of branching narrative. Like Telltale games are the perfect example of this where they give you the illusion many times that the story is actually branching. Such and such will remember this, but they really won't. And a lot of times what it does is it branches for a short period of time and then collapses again. They always find a way to bring it back because otherwise it would be impossible to make that game. Otherwise you would have to be making 25 games depending on how many times you're branching. And that's just unfeasible. So you were just ahead of the curve, my friend. Yeah, it's you need to do that sometimes. Uh, you have your major choices, and then you have the little ones that are just to let you express yourself. You know, when you're outside walking, a lot of those buttons to let you cross the street are just to give you something to do while you wait so you don't walk into the street. It's okay. And yeah, I'll just add on that note, like I have had so much of the same experience where so much of what you've created actually doesn't necessarily make it or you can't do it because of budget or, or whatever. Um, and I think for like for my experience as a creative writer, like I was so used to just having like infinite space of the page, um, infinite space to to make up stories. And as writers, I feel like we we do benefit um, traditional writers. Uh, who publish books and whatnot, um, we just have so much space to work with, um, kind of infinite. And games, if you're interested in working with them, I feel like they will really teach you to be really refined and specific. And you're going to have to make some like really important decisions that you don't usually have to make um, in, a, in other writing practices. <laughs> I mean, there are page limits, but I mean, like, in the end, it's kind of up to you. Like, your book can be. 50 pages or it can be like 300 pages so it depends you know it depends but I mean there is there are limitations but I just feel like my experience working with games um there were way more like restrictions on me as a writer which I had to learn how to to navigate yeah well speaking of those hard decisions sometimes I'm sure that when you're crafting a story you have to deal with what it's going to be like to put the player in a difficult situation. And, you know, today we're having a lot of conversations about these topics. So I'm wondering how you approach just difficult topics in games in terms of you know, how, how to do it effectively and how to do it responsibly or what you've been told. And maybe you talk about this in your courses, Terra Nova, no? <laughs> Uh, well, honestly, this is not usually something that falls in my domain. I know that we hire sensitivity writers to make sure that we're approaching any topic that we don't have uh, firsthand experience in. Um, and we hire people who did go through that and make sure that we're not misrepresenting it. As far as I know, that, that that's how it's handled, but it's usually something outside of my expertise. I don't know, Jill, if you have more experience with that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm the person on the large team for 10 years begging people to hire the sensitivity readers, begging people to diversify the workforce, like highlighting what the problems are, trying to get them changed before they can make it to the public. 
assessing the things that can't be changed and then mitigating how we describe them, trying to figure out even if it's better to stay on a project with problematic material and try to just like mitigate the harm or remove myself from it, figuring out like how do we describe these things in the media. Um, and it's like there's a lot of people just blundering into things who have needed a lot of let's say leadership to even understand that they might need to consider that any topic needs thinking about at all. Um, oh God, who else hey, hired? <laughs> if we're approaching it that broadly and not just difficult situations, I I could have I have a lot of stories about what you're describing right now, which is when someone in on the work te- on the team is trying to uh, is do something and then as a result misrepresents. An, a group, or if you're talking, if that is part of it, I then I have be, many no? stories about that that I could yeah. tell. Uh, and honestly, the my approach for it was, and I learned this from from being in the industry such a long time, is if if you're on a big project. Uh, always escalate it one level higher, um, not higher than that, because honestly, the safety of the person who's working is very important. And if you escalate it one level higher and the person who you are answering to doesn't do anything about it, chances are if you bypass them and go even higher than them to try to get that resolved, there are going to be neg- negative consequences uh, like on you. So your job is to escalate at one level higher. Otherwise, tread carefully. I know you might have different opinions about this, but I've seen it firsthand where I, I went over someone who like, they're not listening to me. This is a problem. And the wrath of not God came down on me. Oh, I'm the draw all the wrath every time. Person. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I've had situations where I had to tread carefully and then wait until I was in a position where I felt comfortable enough to to raise a flag. One certain situation happened where early in my career, I worked on a game that I didn't want to work on, which misrepresented Arabs and Muslims. Um, and specifically, there, the, the, like it crossed a line where I was like, now I can't even like shut up about this. This is too much. Where one of the fight scenes was taking place in a mosque and it was very disrespectful. Uh, and I'm like, you know what? I don't even care if they fire me anymore. I'm I'm done being quiet. So I went to them and I and I said, hey, this is crossing a line. I'm not comfortable with this. And they're like, oh, is it? And they changed it into a palace and they listened to me. And I'm like, wait a sec. There's a whole bunch of other things I want to change too. <laughs> and they're like, okay, well, you should have come sooner. And like, and I realized that my situation had changed. At that point, I wasn't a junior anymore. I was more intermediate in in, in my position. And they're like, your your context, your circumstances have an impact as well. That's the, 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 what I'm trying to say. So like not everybody's voice is equal on a project and it should be, especially on the bigger projects. Um, uh, right now, it's very different than when I started in games 15 years ago. At least now there's there are dialogues about these things. Back then, like it was, you're the black sheep if you brought up anything. Now you're, it, it's bad, but not as bad. It's still bad. Like I have to underline that. It's still, you know, but most of the time what I learned about this is uh, most of the people, not all of the people, most of the people don't want to do anything bad. They just don't know better. And a lot of times you have to speak up really early and they don't give you the opportunity because you don't have visibility on a thing. Because, and then it becomes a production constraint or like money talks and they don't want to change it because of anything. So I always bring the business case and I say, it'll cost you more if you release with this. People are going to be loud on the internet. Now, that happens a lot more often than it used to. Like So the circumstances have changed. So I know there's a lot of layers in my statement. I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit. But I have so much to say all of a sudden because like the, the, the context of the question changed. I thought you meant like more difficult topics that you don't have anything, that, that you don't have a lived experience in. If it's sensitive topics that you ha- do have a lived experience in, I could talk about that forever. Sorry, that was heavy, I know. No, no. I mean, if, if you're just going to make the content that it's easy, just... Go talk to someone who knows about it. Hire the right people. Uh, consider not making it because it's not yours. Yeah, and you're totally fine. You know, you went into like my second question, so in fact, you were just um, being a bit psychic about it. <laughs> Did you want to say something? Let's go. Let's let's do the second part of the question. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, it was just a little bit um, about this and you know the representation of identities a little bit with avatars and customization or rpg personal philosophies challenges um results any stories that you could care about this and what you said about how much it has changed in the couple the last couple of years it's just sort of been broached but i'm interested to hear what else has to say. 
yeah, I'll jump in here. So um, when I when I do talks on on my work and in Terra Nova in particular, I always like opening up with just my journey with indigenous representation in games because I feel like that was what kind of led me to actually like studying this as like a subject, not necessarily like the res representation visually or otherwise, um, but also like who are making these games? Why are they making them, you know, both indigenous and non-indigenous? So um, I always point to like World of Warcraft as like this pivotal moment in my early life growing up where, uh, you know, there's the Tauren race and you can play them and they're very much like the Hollywood Native American stereotype of like, you know, wearing buckskin and feathers and they roam the plains and worship, you know, this earth goddess, et cetera, et cetera. Super problematic, not good. Um, we're, we're, we know who made that, those images and wrote those stories and they were not <laughs> Native American or indigenous people. Um, but as like a 10, 11, 12-ish year old person, I just could not not play as them as an indigenous person. And I think other people would have definitely different experiences than I would. So this is not, I'm not speaking for everyone else, but there was a, there was a power within being able to represent myself the way I wanted to within that game as a very young person. And I think it shaped me um, to, to kind of take that agency and repurpose it for my, my repurpose it, uh, that representation in a way that was powerful to me. And then take that step further when I, when I, when it, when it came time for me to make my own stuff. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I just ended up creating something that I knew about. It wasn't, you know, this first contact narrative in Terra Nova that, um, that I wanted to make and not, not anyone else. So, um, yeah, super, super important and very personal topic, actually. Um, write what you know, create what you know. And if you don't know it and you still want to do it, ask yourself why and take that, that pause. Um, there's a lot of really well-intentioned folks out there. Um, it's, it's admirable, but, you know, we need to pay people and hire people. Um, more than, you know, speak to those, those impulses. I'm just trying to, to, to think about what I have to contribute to this. Um, the characters we work with aren't um, like representations of reality or like we don't have like people in our, in our games. So um, we have lots of like creatures and we work with lots of natural elements. Um, the whole premise, I feel like with, with our stuff, we really want to create environments for people to feel good in, um, environments that um, people can be present within. I know lots of times video games get this rap where people go and to, to spend time to, to distract themselves. Um, and I feel like what we're trying to do is sort of subvert that a little bit and create games that create presence in the player as well as create awareness in them about the environment around them because I think the end goal for us is that we want people to leave the work that the creative work that we do feeling more connected or being able to connect better with other people or with the world around them. Um, and I think there's a great responsibility in, in all art that we create to, to, to be good and not to, you know, to cause any harm. Um, and yeah, that's, I think I can add that as well as, um, yeah, like so much of our work is a, is a environmental by nature, especially like the new work we're, we're exploring. And um, I think that we're trying to create work that isn't per perpetuating the toxic systems that we live on a day-to-day -day life um, in our real lives. We're trying to create these sort of speculative futures where things have maybe gone a bit, bit better than where we're at right now in the real world. Um, so I'm not sure if that's explicitly answering your question, but um, that's what I have to contribute. <laughs> no, no, I think it does. I think it does. And I, it also reminds me to ask you about another changing um, or, yeah, shifting part that's the, the, the rise of VR that I know that you're working in, you know, and I'm, I'm interested if you feel like in the last um, years, the demands of your job have changed, if you've had to um, encounter this, or the writing process has changed in any sort of way? Um, I really like working in VR. It's a super exciting medium. Um, the first time I 
worked on VR, the process was that we were pretty deep in the process at that point when we actually started like programming into the VR. Like we had developed the whole story. Um, but the way that it worked was I would show up and they would play, I would get into the VR set and they would play the scene that they had developed over the last few days. And then I would sit there and I would have to come up with dialogue. So I worked like in tandem with the technology as opposed to creating for the technology, if that makes sense. I was like working um, alongside it. And um, it's such a, I mean, VR is just an incredible uh, technology. I think that, you know, we have lots of, my thinking around VR is that we, again, going back to, I don't want to recreate reality um, with the work I do. Um, I just think that VR, I, you see so many people just recreating reality, like museum VR, and whatever. And I think it's such a great tool to totally create something alien and different and something that people have never experienced before. So I'd like to see way more of that. Um, I'd love to hear about if you guys have any experience in um, I've worked on two VR games actually in the past. Uh, but to answer the question more broadly, I feel now compared to when I started, one of the biggest things that's changed is how much is changing. Um, it's like I've lived through, I started making games when YouTube was useless, when it was just videos of people taking their kids to the zoo. You couldn't learn anything on YouTube. Now you can learn everything on YouTube. Now you have the access to, to be able to make games without writing your own engines. When before engines were out of reach or were extremely expensive, you had to learn coding before you could even think about it. Now you're able to do so much. But as a result, you also have to learn a lot and you have to learn, you have to keep up to date with all this technology that's changing. Like I saw the rise of VR that came out of nowhere. I saw um, the iPhone, you know, I, I made games on mobile phones before there were smartphones. I know a lot of you don't know that this existed. There were dumb phones before there were smartphones. And I, I made like flip Kyocera where you had to, you know, do you know what a keypad is? Like keypads on phones, those things. I made games on those. Like we had to innovate a lot about how do you do movement when it comes to something like that. How, like you, a lot of games were text-based because you were at least you had a keypad for that kind of thing. And when we first started making iPhone games, we approached it as if you were making a console game on iPhone. I, I designed a, a virtual D-pad. I was one of one, our, our team was one of the first teams to make a virtual D-pad until people realized, wait, that's not the necessarily the best way to use this medium. So all of these innovations they happened. Freemium came and like took the mobile uh, world by storm. There was a period where all mobile games were premium. All of these changes were happening happening in rapid succession over a period of a very small period of time and they continue to happen now all of a sudden all the conversations are about AI and how AI is going to be integrated either in the processes or in the games or what have you and there there's a lot that could be said about this and I don't want to derail the conversation but like the only constant now is that change is coming faster faster than it ever has before we have more access to learn things but there's also a lot more to learn so that's a little overwhelming in a lot of different ways it's good and bad, right? Good if we put, yeah. yeah. What a wonderful conversation, a perfect representation of the point of the Writing Life panel, which is to marry the creative and the pragmatic, and you are all wonderful inspirations for the students and for me today. So thank you all very much for coming and for being part of it. And thank you to Four Space again, a wonderful collaboration. Thank you, bye. Oh, you can find all of um, the panelists on, they're all on Instagram. And if you go onto the Writers Read Instagram, they've been tagged. So be sure to follow their career. If you have an idea for a podcast, please let us know. You can contact us by email at info4 at concordia.ca or find us on social media at cu 4 space. All social media is managed by Jacqueline Wexler. This episode of the Fourth Space podcast is hosted by me, Maximus Delmar, and produced by Anna Vaklavec and Douglas Moffat. Editing by myself, Douglas Moffat, and Chanel Lees Marshall. Additional thanks to Supercontinent for providing our theme music. Thanks for listening.